Watching your child endure a depressive episode is heartbreaking and terrifying. You can feel powerless not knowing how to get your child back to a place of well-being. In this video, I'll help give parents tools in becoming therapeutic and how they interact with their child, but also understand some of the biological root cause that is typically part of depression and ways to nourish your child back to a place of not just surviving, but thriving in their lives once again. Welcome to Root Cause of Happiness. I'm Dr. Sarah Bryn Morrow, licensed psychologist, therapeutic yoga teacher, and optimal wellness educator. I teach the physiology of mental health and the skills that empower resilience. Join me as we explore the many pieces of the puzzle to deep healing at the root cause of happiness. When you have a child going through a depressive episode, it is a really scary time as a parent. You're on the sidelines often with a sense that you're watching your child suffering, and yet you have no idea how to help them get through their tough time and come back to a place of enjoying their lives and being happy once again. It's so important to know that as a parent, there's a lot that you can do to support your child. If you'll go back to my last video in which I break down a lot of the root cause of depression, that will help give you a little bit more thoughts about the potential biological factors that could be contributing to the reason your child has depression. But in this video, we'll focus more on where parents have choice to support their child overcoming depression. Depression is getting more and more common amongst adolescents. There's been a frightening increase in suicide rates in recent years. There seem to be many factors at play, but from my viewpoint, I believe one big factor is how technology has changed the world for young people. We're seeing more and more teenagers on their cell phones and social media, but spending less and less time with their friends together in person. There seems to be an epidemic of loneliness amongst teenagers in which they are around people all the time, and yet they don't feel connected. And when you ask teenagers who are feeling this way, they'll say that they do have casual acquaintance friends or perhaps like fair weather friends that they can have fun with, but they don't have deep friendships. They don't have peers in which they can lean on or go to in times of difficulty or to be vulnerable with those friends. So I believe that technology is a factor in making us feel like everyone else's life looks perfect on the photos they share on social media. We don't feel we measure up, and we often feel disconnected as if we're missing out on all the fun and happy times that other people seem to be having, but we don't feel a part of. There's definitely research now showing correlation between time spent on social media, and rates of depression. And so we know that if we do more than just a little bit of social media, it tends to start impacting our mood in negative ways. We can't help but make social comparisons through social media, and we tend to automatically compare ourselves and our lives more negatively relative to what other people share about their lives on social media. So one thing as a parent is to just talk to your child about their screen use. You should encourage them to reduce the amount of time they spend each day on social media. Also, gaming can, of course, get out of hand and take up too much time for young people. But we want to just educate our young people, our children, about how technology influences our mood. And if they're suffering, really not feeling well, to encourage them to either take a break from technology altogether or at least reduce that down to hopefully maybe only one to two hours a day at most. If you have to as a parent, you might need to intervene to reduce technology time, but ideally we avoid punishment or conflict with our teenagers and try to just encourage them to make healthier choices for themselves. And perhaps there are some family rules that we do enforce 
such as not bringing cell phones into your bedroom at nighttime. There's research showing that just having a cell phone in your bedroom will reduce the amount of sleep you get. Whether or not the phone, you know, makes any notification sounds, just having that technology near us keeps our brain in a little bit of a state of alertness, it seems. And of course, I have many, many teenagers I've helped where if they can't sleep, you know, quickly and easily, then they right away just get on their cell phone and will stay up hours in the night just scrolling on their phone. So we really do want to have some healthy limits and rules around technology. I recommend no technology in the bedroom after bedtime and no technology at mealtimes to try to sit as a family together, at least for dinner each day, is ideal. So we want some limits on technology, but mostly just to inform our children about the risks tied to their mental health, their rates of depression, through excessive use of especially social media. So that's one factor to consider. But we do tend to see that children and teenagers are feeling more lonely. I have a lot of kids tell me that it's not their own technology use that's the problem, but their parents. And so just as teenagers are susceptible to getting drawn in or a little bit addicted to technology and social media, so can moms and dads. And so as a parent, if your child is at all going through some emotional difficulty, or maybe just because it's a better quality of life, I would really encourage you to not be on your phone when you're physically with your children. So don't bring your phone to mealtimes. If you're at a restaurant, put it away. Just be with your family and see each other and talk together. If your child comes in the room and you're watching a show or listening to a podcast, turn it off and turn to look at your child and make eye contact and smile. So we often are missing these little tiny opportunities to connect kind of heart to heart, mind to mind with our teenagers, especially. So whenever you can, when you get to see your kids, highlight their, their moment with you. Stop what you're doing if you can. Turn to them, look them right in the eye, smile as if you're just so incredibly happy to see them and check in, you know, ask them, how's your day going? What are you up to? How are things going with your friends lately? And see if you can draw them into some time together. Now, you don't want to bombard them with questions, but it's really great to invite conversation and invite them to share with you a little bit about how they're doing and what they're doing these days. So see your children when you can and take advantage of the influence on our mental health, our nervous system changing when we see somebody greet us with kind of this, hey, I'm your friend, you know, energy, eye contact, smile, setting down what I'm doing to fully attend to you being here in front of me. These might sound like really easy things to do, but they're little small things that we can lose habit with, and especially as our children move into their teen years and tend to be a little bit less interested in hanging out with us once they're into their friendships and peer relationships more than their parent relationships. So try to take advantage of those little moments and try to make sure that you're not accidentally prioritizing technology over those little moments to connect and interact with your child. So technology is one factor. Movement is another factor. We also have kids and teenagers not getting enough movement and not getting enough time outside. So sunlight is so importantly good for us. We know that getting daylight in the morning and also avoiding blue light in the evening is one of the best things we can do to support good sleep. And getting enough sleep is essential for mood stability and preventing depression. So we really want to try to make sure that we encourage our kids to get outside more, to have hobbies in which they're just playing physically. And maybe they have an enjoyment in a sport, or maybe we can find a new hobby for them. It's good to check out things like teen exercise classes, even classes online like free yoga classes or dance classes, and encourage our children to find some ways to enjoy being physical in their bodies and being active. Maybe you can invite your child to go on a walk with you. There's even research just showing that walking is very good for mental health. 
And most of us can hopefully talk our kid into at least a 10 minute quick walk. I have seen a lot of clients who say they don't want to walk with their parent because they feel trapped in conversation. And so if you invite your teenager to go on a walk with you and they turn you down, you can try to reassure them, hey, we can just walk. If you don't want to talk right now, that's okay. We can just have a little power walk together. And so invite them and allow them to know that if they're not up for conversation, that's okay, but you'd love for them to get outside with you for just a few minutes. So short and sweet, but consistently encouraging our children to get outside and have movement be part of their daily self-care. Depression very often is an umbrella symptom that indicates that something is out of balance in the body. So we're learning more and more about the role of inflammation affecting mental health and especially increasing risks of depression. So unfortunately, a lot has changed for kids in recent decades, one of those changes being the kind of um, overtaking our world of technology, but another huge factor that I'm sure is impacting child mental health is the way that the food system has changed. So we now have young people growing up with nutrition deficiencies in the foods that tend to be available. And so one thing to consider if your child does have significant depression is to find a functional medicine doctor that can run some labs and look at essential nutrients in your child's body and try to figure out if there's anything specifically at a very low level that would be affecting their brain's ability to have sufficient levels of neurotransmitter production. So this is an important thing to know is available that Nutrients matter, and we can test nutrients, and we can then shift our dietary choices or use supplementation guided by a doctor to fill in any gaps in our child's diet to make sure their body has these essential building blocks needed to create the hormones and neurotransmitters that the body depends on to function well. So, you might consider, though, just of your own assessment of your child's nutrition how they might be doing with eating plant diversity, because we know for sure that we need a large variety of fruits and vegetables, nuts, seeds, and beans in the diet, each plant offering different nutrients and a wide variety of antioxidants and polyphenols. And so these are components in plants that allow our body to build the hormones and neurotransmitters that it needs, but also to reduce oxidative stress and to hopefully have a healthy, diverse microbiome in the gut. And we know that gut health and mental health go hand in hand. So we want to try to do at least at the very minimum, minimize sugar in our child's diet. And I realize that is a tough task in today's food system. But we could at least start by maybe shifting away from drinking soda or any really sugary beverages and move towards herbal teas or sparkling waters. So trying to at least change beverages away from anything with a high sugar load, knowing that sugar in liquid form, like a soda, will cause a huge spike in blood sugar followed by a huge crash. And we're learning more and more that blood sugar stability is really important in mood stability. So we want to reduce any large sugar kind of doses in our child's diet. And when we do have treats, like a bit of ice cream or cookies or dessert, ideally that sugar will come after a meal so that the fats and proteins will help the body stabilize the blood sugar spike from eating that treat. So there's a lot we can do to just make little changes here and there and try to move our child away from a lot of sugars and slowly increase nutrient diversity. I'm gonna follow up this video with a short video just outlining my favorite smoothie ingredients that have a lot of antidepressant nutrients built in, but some things to try to add into your child's diet would be healthy fats and especially omega-3 fatty acids. So we know those to be found in fatty fish, especially salmon and sardines, walnuts, hemp, chia, and flax seeds, 
some other nuts and seeds. And we want to try to add in healthy fats to support the brain. The brain is mostly made of fat. A lot of the brain is actually made of cholesterol. So even things like healthier eggs, so free range or high omega-3 eggs are a good choice. Coconut oil, avocado oil, these are fats that can be supportive of the brain having the nutrients it needs to function well. So healthy fats are important. Plant diversity, even things like herbs and spices, which tend to have high levels of antioxidants. Vitamin D, very important, so getting more sunshine, really helpful. And then trying to reduce inflammation as well through possibly herbs like turmeric. So I always put in just a small amount of turmeric in most of the foods that I cook for my family. And turmeric is a powerful anti-inflammatory and known to have some benefits in supporting mental health. So these are little things we can work on. And I'll again provide that next video to give you a, a list of ingredients I love to put in our smoothies. So often what will happen is that a child seems to be doing fine. They reach puberty age and all of a sudden there's a lot more social stressors. Their hormones are unstable, going through a lot of fluctuation. Parents tend to lose more control over the foods their children access or the drinks they consume. And we can see mental health to start to fall apart into the teenage years. And as I've worked with many, many families that have a depressed teenager, what I will often hear is that teenagers who are depressed want to talk to their parents, but their parents' responses tend to shut the child down. Now, I believe all parents are trying their best. I think that almost all parents fully love their child and want to respond in helpful ways. But sometimes our reactions and our attempts to fix our children's issues can actually make things worse and shut them down, seeking us out as a source of support. So one cue that I have for myself when my teenagers are sharing with me is to cue myself WAIT, which stands for Why Am I Talking? And that acronym comes out of a book called Sitting Together. But it's a cue to remind therapists, but also parents, why am I talking? I need to just listen. I, if, if there's a teenager, a child trying to share with you, open up to you, even just vent and complain about their day, listen, hold space, reflect back a little bit of what you're hearing, but try not to jump in and fix things or overshare your wisdom unless it's invited. So first wait and just allow your child to express. Make eye contact, show that you're fully listening to what they're telling you. If you're not clear, you can seek clarification. It sounds like you're telling me you're feeling this way, is that right? Or it sounds like with this friend, you're kind of going through these kinds of issues. Am I hearing that correctly? and ask for clarification, which really shows you're trying to understand. And then ask for permission to give your input. So with teenagers, it's really helpful to say, I really appreciate you talking to me. I want to understand what you're going through. And I have a few thoughts or ideas I want to share, but I don't know if you really want to hear them right now. Would it be okay if I give you a couple ideas that I have, how you might take care of that issue or what you might do with that difficult friend? And usually young people will say, yeah, okay, you know, but keep it short. <laughs> Mental note other things you want to say to them eventually, but realize there is no urgency to fix all their things at one time or to go too much, too long into this one conversation. So offer a little bit of short and sweet ideas or suggestions and don't overdo it. Be really looking for your child to kind of glaze over or put their head down or start to feel uncomfortable talking with you and make yourself stop and just listen and be present. So try not to fix their problems, but it is helpful to reflect back the emotion they're expressing. So one of our keys to emotional resilience 
is being able to put our feelings into words. So being able to be upset and be able to pause, step aside and kind of look at ourselves and be able to give name to the feeling. Wow, like I'm really feeling depressed today. Gosh, I'm really feeling anxious, anticipating this big thing coming up. I'm really stressed. I'm so stressed. I'm feeling overwhelmed with everything I have to deal with right now. So we really want from a young age, ideally, to be putting feelings into words for our children, not just their own feelings, but our feelings as their parent to be able to label our emotions. I often teach parents and children to communicate with each other from a place of I feel and I need. As a parent, perhaps, I'm feeling worried about how you're doing lately. I really need to see that you're taking good care of yourself and I want to come up with ideas of things you could do for yourself that might make things better right now. So from a child's point of view, I'm feeling frustrated about these rules. I need you to understand what I would like to happen here. So we can really help have assertive but nonviolent communication as our family way of communicating together from a place of I feel and I need versus saying you, you know, you are feeling this way. Well, don't ever put feelings into someone's um, you know, your, your interpretation of their feelings into your own words, you might ask them, I can tell you're really upset. How are you feeling right now? It seems to me like you're feeling depressed. Is that true? Do you feel depressed right now? What does that mean to you if you're feeling depressed? What's that like for you? But we want to teach our children how to communicate their inner experience, starting with how they feel in words And also, what do they need? Do they have ideas or requests for what they need? So those are helpful communication tools to be practicing from as early on with your children as you can. But for a depressed teenager, we want to try to reflect back the feelings they're sharing and not just negative feelings, but we also want to point out to them when they seem to be having a better day, when they seem to be having a moment of joy when they've had a win or a success or a positive social experience of some kind. It's very common when we go through depression that we get into a very skewed negativity bias in which we are blind to see the balance of good and bad in our lives. We tend to feel just really focused as if everything is really negative. And it's helpful for a depressed child to have a loving adult help them recognize and dwell in and soak in and relive anything positive and any things in which they might be able to find some gratitude. It can be really nice, especially if you have a younger child going through depressed moods or just risk signs that they might be at risk for depression down the road, to start a gratitude practice as a family. So one way to do this is getting a jar of some kind or a container and decorating it in some fun way, and having it be the family's gratitude jar. And each day, if you can, or just when a good moment arises, try to remember and encourage your children to remember, hey, this is an awesome thing. Let's write a note and put it in our gratitude jar. And it's really fun if you start this on January 1st, and then come the end of the year, you can empty your jar and take turns opening and reading the notes your family put in there throughout the course of the year, realizing and remembering so many positive things that did in fact occur. So we have to practice exercising the brain towards a more balanced view of life. Yes, there are hard things and we should not push those away or deny them or numb those feelings. We should lean into those feelings sometimes talk about them, cry, vent, complain, journal. Yes, feel and explore those painful emotions, but don't stay limited in only that. Try to stay open and zoomed out to see there's a lot of wonderful things too. There's a lot to be grateful for, a lot to be hopeful about. And even if this is hard right now, 
thank goodness all things continue to change and we know we'll move through these acute chapters of difficulty. So there's a lot we can do to be a better listener, to reflect back, to try to encourage to put feelings into words, our own and for our children. We can help shift their narrative away from a stuck, limited, negative frame to a more broad, balanced view, recognizing all the good and finding intentional things to be grateful for. And we can also do things like softening the energy and how we hang out as a family. So if you're going to watch TV or a movie together, watch something funny. It changes our biochemistry to smile and laugh. And it really changes things when we laugh in community with other people. So watch funny shows or funny videos together. Don't bring up all the political stress of the world with your kids. Talk about some of the awesome discoveries or cool scientific advancements or things that might be happening in the future that you're excited about to see where they go. And speak about the world and the future in as hopeful and optimistic terms as you can. Not being all sugarcoating and disregarding the hardships of life and and the bad things going on in the world, but recognizing there's a lot of good stuff too. There are way more awesome people doing incredibly great things than there are people causing harm. And humanity as a whole is making steady progress over time. Sometimes it feels like we're going backwards, but on the whole, if we zoom out, we can see humanity slowly figuring out how to do things better as a species and how to love each other and treat each other with more respect, compassion, and kindness. So certainly help your children reflect back on the medieval times to now and see how far we've come. So there's a lot we can do for our children. Look at them in the eye, smile, laugh with them, share funny jokes and stories. Touch is so important. So it's really important, especially with teenagers who tend to get a little guarded as they go through their own development, that we have little bits of loving touch. So You know, if I walk by one of my teenage sons and he's on his computer, I'll just kind of be like, hey, buddy, how's it going? You know, and just like pat his arm as I'm walking past. Or if I'm trying to squeeze through a space, just like a loving touch on their back, asking for a hug goodbye before they take off or a hug goodnight, Um, high fives, fist bumps, you know, little moments of positive physical connection is more valuable than we realize. And sadly, I've worked with families that have stopped hugging and they don't have any physical touch amongst parent-child relationship at all. And I think that leaves children in a really dysregulated place. And we need a sense of support of community through the rituals humans have always had around, you know, just little things like shaking hands, hugging hello and goodbye, loving eye contact with a smile dancing together, walking together. These are sort of built into the human body and we can choose these things on purpose and they only move us towards feeling happier. So little energetic exchanges like that can also be helpful. Sleep is a big factor in why teenagers become depressed. It's one reason I have advocated for later school start times for high school students and middle school students. At the point of puberty, adolescents tend to shift their sleep-wake cycle towards two hours more nocturnal than when they were young children. And what this means is when high school starts really early, we have teenagers that can't go to bed at nine. You can make them go to bed, but very few of them will be able to sleep. And so when they have to get up very early, they are becoming chronically sleep-deprived. And so what we see is that throughout the course of the academic school year, rates of depression tend to go up and up. And then through the summer, when teenagers are getting sufficient sleep, rates of depression are much lower. There might be other factors involved in those numbers, like social stressors and even exercise and sunlight exposure in the summer improving for most people. 
But for sure, a loss of sleep over time is very detrimental to mental health, and exhaustion often looks like depression. So as best as you can, try to encourage your whole family to honor a sleep-wake cycle. So we really want to have in the morning, curtains open, blinds open, fresh air, sunlight as much as possible. That morning sunlight exposure is going to help set the internal clock for melatonin production happening roughly 14 hours later as we're winding down for bed. So get up and be active. If your children get up sleepy, put on some music and try to boost the energy in the home in the mornings. We definitely want to have a wind down in the evening. Thinking about avoiding caffeine after lunch is also important. But a wind down in the evening where we actually turn off overhead lights, have more lamp light, so more horizon level orange tone lighting versus bright overhead lighting minimize screen time at least an hour before bed, and have a consistent bedtime. Now your teenager might need a later bedtime, but they still need a bedtime. So try to enforce a lights out policy, reserving at least eight to nine hours for potential sleep each night. So as early as you have to get up, try to plan for that and honor at least an eight hour bedtime sleep opportunity each night. I have a whole video on sleep and ways to help children with sleep, so do dive into that and learn more if you have a sleep issue with your child that could be a root cause if they're struggling with depression. But please know that sleep is important, and the more we can get consistent sleep, the more we're supporting the health of the brain and therefore a more stable, balanced mood. So one way to think about supporting your child in navigating their difficult emotions is first of all to let it be. Let it be that they're upset, that they're feeling negative, they're feeling grumpy. Let them vent and complain and be upset and hold space and be a witness and listen fully. Then we can gently encourage our children to try to let it go, which means what pieces of their sadness can they let go of? What are some things they don't need to worry about some more long-term issues they can kind of unburden themselves from, negative thoughts, self-criticism, friend issues, to encourage them to say, I know that's hard, but the more you think about it, it's just hurting you. Can we try to just let that one go? No matter how much you think about it, it's not going to change it. We can also try to let go of the negative energy in the body by relaxing and smiling and shifting posture. And then we try to let it in, anything positive, any self-care that we can muster. So can we let in a smile, a laughter, hug, go on a walk, see things that are positive in the world, things we're grateful for, and try to let in any positives that are within reach and within our control. So let it be. Don't try to push away, numb, distract, or fix it. Let it be. Let go of the negatives and let in the positives that are within reach for us. So these are some techniques to work on, but please do take your child's emotions seriously. If we have a child or a teenager who seems depressed consistently many days in a row or many weeks or months where they're depressed more of the time than not, we likely have a biological root cause of some kind happening. Medication, unfortunately, is not nearly as effective or safe as we wish it was, but there are many things we can do to support the physical health of the body. If you can find a doctor to run labs, that will help you become more strategic, but even without guidance from a doctor, start reading and learning more and try to get down to the root cause of what might have gone wrong in your child's mood stability and mental health, and start to work on some basics in self-care, reducing harmful inflammatory foods, beverages, toxins, adding in a lot of plant nutrients and healthy fats, making sure we get movement, fresh air, 
time with others, time with other people moving together, walking together, dancing. These are really biologically beneficial to us, honoring our need for sleep, and finding ways to nourish the social connections that we all are hungry for in this modern era. So these are things we can do each day, including changing the conversation away from the stress and negativity in the world and bring in more positive news and jokes and fun things. And just on the most basic level, look your child in the eye every day. Send them the most love through your eye-to-eye gaze as you can. See their inner beauty. Smile with joy at being in their presence. And put down your own distractions to be fully open to being present, listening and supporting your child without trying to fix or kind of outdo them with your wisdom or your ongoing lecture about what they should do to fix their problems. Offer suggestions, but keep it short and come back to that conversation in little pieces over time. Invite your children to talk to you, check in with them, put feelings into words, and invite them to join you in positive self-care activities as much as possible. It's scary having a child going through depression. We worry so much about our children. We're so desperate to save them from unnecessary suffering in life. And yet the human journey is one of emotional ups and downs and depression being one of those challenges that most people have to navigate, at least to some degree, some of the time. So pay attention and just be curious. Ask your child if you're not sure. And wherever you can, try to be strategic and intentional and think about nourishing your child at the root cause of the different pieces of the puzzle that might be causing them to feel unhappy. I hope this was helpful for you. Again, I have a lengthy video about depression in more general terms with more biology built in. I'll have a separate video about suicide prevention. And I will have a short video about smoothies that are an antidepressant kind of nutrient package in a yummy smoothie. So some of those videos will be relevant if you want to keep learning more. Thanks. Thank you for joining me at Root Cause of Happiness. If this information was useful to you, please share it with others seeking knowledge and tools for resilience. It is a meaningful contribution to the world when we become proactive in our healing journeys by learning and growing, by increasing our awareness, by addressing the root cause of happiness.